bubble could be from the from us actually getting the product from the vendor all the way to getting payment. A low level could be or taking an order for a pizza. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be everything for the company. So we have low level and high level. Okay. Now, with process discovery, like I said, a good thing to use is something like Visio. Now, um, with process maps, we're going to hear uh, there's different terms for them. Like, if you Google the word process maps in Six Sigma, you're going to find like eight different terms. The first one we're, we're going to start off with is the macro process maps. And so the macro process, oh, got right a little bit bigger here. Good. So macro process map is going to essentially be, um, let's look at something small. Let's look at just, you know, something quick, just to give an idea. So for our example, we're going to use ordering a pizza. So level one, we have a, I'm going to use a round circle, customer hungry. <laughs> okay, can you guys read that, or is that still too small? Uh, it's still a bit small. Okay, yeah. still a bit small, okay. I just got to change my writing style here a little bit. Okay, so customer Customer hungry. Now that could be the very first start of the step, right? Yes. Is that any better? Yes. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now the next step is our customer is going to do what? Call. Oh, you know. Or order. So our customer is saying, mm -hmm. okay, I want to call for the order. Oh, and this customer hungry should be more of a start. It's a it's like a, a oblong circle. Call for order. Yes. And then we're going to do what? We're going to answer phone. What's that? Answer, answer phone. phone. Yeah, answer your phone. We could take the order or it could be answer the phone. This is the most difficult thing about making process maps. How detailed do you get? And the, the general rule is um, some of the things, you, you know, like answering the phone might just be assumed when you take the order. But you're right, Robert, with today's internet, with today's, you know, probably being able to text an order now, there's how are we taking that order? That might end up getting broken up later. I agree with you on that. Okay? So then we might make the pizza. This is just kind of a macro, just looking at the overall. But you could get into a lot more, right? A lot more than I'm showing you. So you mm -hmm. can get into make pizza, and then you could get into, uh, uh, you know, we just I'll continue down here so you guys can see it. Then it could be like cooked pizza. After cooked pizza, um, we could we could have a decision. Remember, a decision is a triangle. And what can happen at the decision? We cooked the pizza, but what would be a decision right here? Pick up or delivery? Is, uh, is, uh, one could be, is it ready? Is it ready? I'd probably say, uh, you know, here, you want to check the pizza. Because what could happen? What happens to the pizza a lot? They, they can burn it, right? You might... Our favorite pizza place wouldn't burn it, right? But it could burn the pizza. So if they burn the pizza, we may have to send it back to where? We may make the pizza in. Okay. But if it does work, then we could box the pizza. Okay. And after we're done boxing the pizza, we could deliver the pizza. Just as you said, let's deliver the pizza, and then at the end, customer eats. Our customer pays us, and then customer eats. 
Mm-hmm. Now, here's the difficult part. Because like I said, how much do you put into each process? When you get to work, you're going to have to, you're going to have to get an understanding of their environment. What does their environment say? Do they want to have every little step in their macro? Do they not? You know, and the best way to do it is pull ones up that they've done before. If they didn't ever do them, well, you're in luck because no one's ever done them before. So whatever you do is going to set the standard. You can also, um, uh, like I said, make sure that everything I show you, you Google it so you can see many, many, many examples. And you can read many articles on how many different people do it. Because everybody's got their own little style to it. Okay. <coughs> um, now, sometimes we'll have a process map, and we'll, they'll also call it a worker level. And a worker level, because that was more of a map, it just kind of showed how everything worked, but it didn't really say who was responsible for what, right? It didn't, we didn't really define who was responsible for what. We, I could be one person working at a pizza place and do every one of those functions, right? Somebody calls in sick, I could be the person taking the order, I could be the person making the pizza, mm -hmm. I could be the person delivering the pizza. So um, the next part is if I was a, sh a cook. Now, when I write smaller, I, I change the camera. Does it show the smaller or should I still keep writing bigger? Uh, right now, I don't see anything. I haven't read yet, but I'm just saying one oh, okay. before. Just tell me if you can read this. Can you read take order? Yep. Are you sure? Yeah. Or is it that's, that's about as that's about as small as you can write because it's it starts to get pixelized, but uh, <clears throat> yes, I can read it too. How's that? Is that any better? It's I feel like I'm in an eye doctor's office. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. The, the issue is, is like on your E's, uh, your your first E with the dashes, the second dash uh, basically disappears in a pixel. But I know that it is an E, so I, yes, I can read it. Oh, okay. It's, tell me when it gets readable. It it it's good enough. Are you better there? All right. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah. That's good enough. Okay. <coughs> All right. So take order would be the first one. And then we have a, so this is from the perspective of our cook. So our cook is going to take order. And what are some of the things that he's, he or she is going to have to have? And sometimes they'll draw the diagram more like this. Now, you may draw it a totally different way. But they need pizza dough. Okay? They need to add ingredients. What's on the top? Pizza dough. Pizza dough, okay. And then the middle one's just add ingredients. So I'll just put add ing. <coughs> okay? And then they might want to. something like place an oven, right? Mm -hmm. um, observe frequently. So they may want to observe the pizza. Yes. So they, <coughs> now, so they may want to observe the pizza and then, you know, just, you could keep adding on to this, like they want to be able to they want to be able to cook. They um, they want to cook the pizza. It, it's just important you understand that you know um, whenever you're drawing these process maps, you may have like 20 different versions of them. But the one is you can have a macro, kind of gives you a little show or a high level one what you could do, and then usually a worker level one. Those two are going to be your most important to start. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. So. <clears throat> Um, always break it down into those. Okay, now next.
Let's take a look at <coughs> different types of processing maps. And if we have a process map, and this is also in um, uh, Visio, one of the things that I like is when you put stuff in swim lanes. And what, what I mean by a swim lane is that will help us decide what happens, who does what. So in this case, we could say um, who's responsible on the side, let me just make sure you guys can see this, could be like a customer. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Another swim lane could be the, ca uh, the cashier. Okay. Are you guys reading? Well, kind of. Yeah. Actually, that helps. Oh. Uh, I made it too big. Hold on a second. Let me see. Okay. Okay, so you can kind of see customer would be up here, cashier would be down here. And what you do is you just put each function at the level. So the customer <coughs> could be, remember how he was, the customer here, she was hungry, right? So customer hungry, that would go in that way. If we said customer places order, customer places order would also be in his way, right? Because he's responsible. Now, the cashier is going to take the order, so then we just draw the line down here and take order. So, hungry, place order, take order, and the cashier. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Mm hmm. Okay, Marissa? Yeah. So, <coughs> you can keep creating um, these lanes. Because like you could have another one, another one that would be like the cook, right? And the cook would, you know, uh, make you know make the dough, make the pizza, and just so forth and so forth. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on just how to draw out charts. As long as I think you guys have the general idea, I think if I asked you for homework tonight to make a swim flow chart even by hand, if you didn't want to use Visio, you could do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, one, one thing let me throw out here is that one of the real values that I've seen with this is that it shows where a part of a process becomes overloaded. Um, let's say with the uh, cook, uh, we find out the cook has to uh, knead the dough, it has to put it on the plate, he has to refill the ingredient containers, he has to do this and do this and do this and do this. Uh, where he has, let's say, 20 steps in the process, whereas everybody else has one then we can start to see, oh, there's a bottleneck here. Absolutely. That's a great point. If there's too many steps for one person, it might be, you know, we need to break up the steps or figure out how to shorten what they're doing. So, I mean, because obviously, in this example, the cook is probably going to end up with, you know, a good 70% of all the work, if you put it in time, you know, we're responsible for the process. Is there a quicker way to do it? I don't know. Maybe the cook's always... Well, maybe you could introduce a prep person, you know, somebody who, maybe your cook was making the dough, freeing the pizza, maybe you could get somebody who just makes the dough all day, you know, if it's uh, not frozen dough, or maybe you switch to frozen dough. You know, like a Domino's, they, they know they don't have time to make dough all day, so they use, you know, pre-frozen dough from, you know, they make it at a factory and send it to themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a great point. Well, how, you know, traditionally, you know, a lot of restaurants used to make everything by hand, you know, but they don't anymore. More and more of this stuff is coming out of a can or is pre-processed or, you know, like McDonald's obviously doesn't make its own hamburger patties, I mean, at, at the uh, McDonald's, right? Yep. Because they found out that's, it's process-wise, it's better to have a package made at a factory and then cooked at McDonald's, Okay. I mean, somebody was um, telling me the other day, even like, uh, you know, Olive Garden. Mm -hmm. that it's kind of like a, uh, like a lot of their pastas, from my understanding, are actually microwaved. What they do is they, 
Oh, I'm sorry? Or the convection oven, maybe. Uh, I forget which one of the two. But they have, like, bags that they send the portions in because they want to control the portions of everything. And then well, by the time they, then they get to the Olive Garden, and they basically heat it up. You know, so they're not really making the lasagna in the back. They're not really even making the pasta. The pasta is pre-cooked, and they just put it in, like, a convection oven or a microwave and just heat it up. So, you know. But I mean, it's pretty pretty good quality as far as we know, you know. But just mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just found that interesting that even at like a restaurant yeah. like that where you're paying twenty bucks a plate or fifteen a plate, they're really still just getting fast food. Okay, so process is real important. All right. <clears throat> okay, so that's swim lanes. Now, one of the things that we also talked about a different type of process map. Um, was it? Make sure I can get the board here. S I P O C. Now, S I O P C. As who's had a chance to make one of these and who has not? Robert, you made one, right? I'm sure I did. Yes. Okay. I have it. You have it. Okay. So I'm going to make one up on the board. I'm just trying to see with this new. Measure how much space I actually have here. That's uh, a little high, but uh, that's high. Yeah. All right, that's a pretty small window. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's a really small window, but I'm going to work with it. I'm going to get it done for you. Okay. Now, S I P O C. Does anybody know what it stands for? No. <laughs> Our answer, Marissa. That's what. <laughs> That's what I like about you women from Bangton. Now, straight to the point, right? Yeah. Okay. Supplier, input, processes, outputs, customers, okay, and <coughs> control. Or so, customer, I'm sorry, customer. Okay. Supplier, input, process. Output, customer. Output, customer. Thank you. Now, sometimes... Um, we will add the word requirements when we make the chart just so we know what the customer wants. So I'm going to kind of draw one out here, like a very simple one. Um, so what you first thing you do, you draw like a little box. And you put suppliers, okay? And then you draw another little box. And if you have a notebook, you may want to kind of, this is in your book, but you may want to just, you know, for your own practice, create one mm -hmm. process. Okay, so you have suppliers, inputs, processes, outputs. Okay, outputs, customers. And require and requirements. Now, so the so at this point, um, if we were taking like a a, a a pizza order, we have to um, just, you know figure out who our suppliers are. Now our suppliers can be a lot of people that are part of this. Now um, it's all over the place, you know, how to do this, but. Uh, like I said, another thing that's a great thing to go go because you'll see literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different versions of it. But a supplier could be simple as like Cisco. They make food, right? Cisco. Uh, another one may be AT and T because they're supplying our for our phones. Another one could be uh, Staples because they're supplying the paper we're taking the order with. Um, what's another couple of things that might be that we might have? A uh, produce company. Okay, so John's Produce. First, so what's another thing a pizza company might buy? Supplier. <coughs> um, paper products. Uh, you know the cups and silverware. Pizza boxes, right? Yeah. Yep. 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 So, so put Mike's cardboard or Mark's corrugated, whatever. You know this. 
<clears throat> All I want you to do is get the understanding of how to do it. So we first start with suppliers. And we have we have a small list, a big list. If you're working for GE, you're not going to write a huge list of everything that goes into that company. You're working on what's affecting the process that's important to you. Or just using a small pizza company as an example. Now, <clears throat> the inputs would be could be a lot of different things. Like the inputs are going to help us create the end product. And this is where it gets a little weird too. Because like an input could be the pizza type. Right? Because when you go to the restaurants now, when I was a kid, you could only really buy pizzas in different sizes. But now they have thin crust, big crust, you know, uh, I don't even know. There's so many of them now, you know. Uh, uh, Stuffed crust. Yeah, yeah, deep dish, right? There's a whole bunch of types. So, um, <coughs> The size, we know that's pretty normal. That's been around for a long time. So we know we're going to get some feedback on the pizza type, the size, the quantity, how many pizzas do we want, right, um, from this order. Because remember, that the main thing is we're following a process of the order of the customer. Does the customer want extra toppings? They said, yeah, I want a, you know, a, a pizza, but what else do you want on it? Extra toppings. Uh, is there anything special that you need done, part of your order? Maybe some people like to, the, you know, the pizza not cooked quite as much, or maybe they want to have a split in half. Like, you know, some people like half mushroom, half pepperoni, right? Because there's somebody they work with doesn't want both. Okay. What's something else that you may order, Marissa? When you're making a pizza order, what are some of the other things that may go into the order? Just think about yourself. You're, you're, call a local pizza place. What are some of the things you might say? Type of crust. I see that's kind of probably pizza type. Pizza type. Think about like add-ins, right? You might be saying, can I have some soda with that order, right? Because it's the order. It doesn't matter. I'm just pointing that out. The order is for pizza, but couldn't they throw in other items with it? They might say other things, like chicken wings. As part of the pizza order, can I have some chicken wings? So mm -hmm. it's just important, important we understand that the input is really anything that we're going to have to input to that order to be completed. It doesn't have to be, but for this example, it is. Okay. Now, what's something really important? If we're going to deliver a pizza, what is something we need, Marissa? When the customers... <coughs> A vehicle? Um, a vehicle, yeah. You could, the vehicle would be part of the, uh, it's, it could be part of the, in, the input. But we need the customer's... Oh, address. Address. Contact info, right? Phone number. Name. Okay. So it's not just a matter of taking a pizza order, right? It's not just a matter of that. Now, these maps look as you take the process and you draw a little line down here, you draw it to the end, and you draw another little line, and you draw it down here. And what that does, it doesn't necessarily match up top. It's just the process. And you, so you can't make it huge because you don't have a lot of room. Well, like one of the first things in the bottom, let me see if I can, one of the first things that you have in the bottom. Okay, if we just draw out the process, is we could say our little round, around me, round means start. So means start, but we're going to say, um, remember our custom call for order. Mm -hmm. Because in the past example, we put customer was hungry, but that's not really the start of our process, is it? The customer was just a big overview, but he's going to call for the order. We're going to answer the phone. So I'll just put AP, answer phone, just so you guys can see it. We're going to write order. So just WO, write order. We're going to confirm order. There's a CO there. We might set the price so the person knows. We might ask them for address, phone number, address, phone number. And order, 
to cook. Okay? So in this example, right, this SIPOC covered what? The, just the order process to the cook. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So we're going to see how all, in this SIPOC, we, we're just covering the process to get it to the cook so far. Okay? And that's, that's important. Now... What is the last thing that you've got on there? Oh, I'm sorry. You're here? Order yeah. to cook. Order to cook. Thank you. Yep. Order to cook. Okay. So next, our, we're going to look at outputs. As part of this order, what should some of the outputs be? Now, we're not really worried about making the um, delivery yet. So I'm going to go back and take vehicle off there because we're really just worried more about the cooking process of it. So now the outputs, if it went to the cook, what are some of the outputs that we can expect? A fresh, hot, delicious pizza. Right. We're going to expect a pizza. Okay. We can expect... Order confirmation also, because remember, when we were back here in the input, we took the order, so order confirmation. Did we get everything that they wanted? We can also expect, um, you know, the delivery info, because we got that from before. Remember, I said mm -hmm. we're going to ask for the phone number. And you're going to need a box. Yeah, we're going <coughs> to... So, pizza box. So, you're starting to see how it works, right? I mean, now that you see it, it's a lot easier. It's just, what are my sparks, my inputs? What, what is the overall process? What are the outputs? And then the customer is, um, and what's going what, what to, what's the customer to this process? Who's the customer to this process? So far, he's the initiator. Well, he's the initiator, right? But just as a little, just to throw you off a little bit, our end customer is eventually a customer. But as the beginning of this process, who ends up, who is one of the customers also? The order taker. The order taker, the cook, right? Because the, or the cook couldn't do anything without the first part of the process. So wasn't he a customer at some point in the process? Okay. Okay. So the cook, the order taker, <coughs> accounting. Is an accounting going to be a customer? As part of this process, we took an order. We ran it through the cash register. Aren't they going to mm -hmm. need the results of what we did? True. Yeah. Okay. So our customer is anybody who needs something beyond what we did. All right. And the last one is requirements. Now, requirements are important. Now, not sometimes requirements are also put in between these different levels. Like sometimes you might see requirements, you know, from input. Sometimes you might see requirements uh, after output. Sometimes from customer. They may have a separate section for each one of those. And the reason they might do that is when they say like pizza type, you know, or size. They might say requirements might be, must be seven, eight, seven inches, must be eight inches, might be nine inches. Or um, extra toppings. Extra toppings must not weigh more than six ounces, cannot weigh less than three ounces, depending on the piece that's put on. Because one of the biggest things in restaurants over the last 20 years is portion control. Like, like if you go to almost any restaurant, portion control to keep the recipe accurate, but also to control cost. Like if you go to a restaurant and one day they have big portions, another day they have small portions, they're not really controlling their costs and they're not getting their customers used to what they're trying to serve. When manufacturing, the same thing. We may say, well, you know, the part that we want to produce, it must meet these requirements. We might have those requirements all the way through this chart. Okay, so some of the things that might be important for taking the order is call time. Right? We might put something like less than three minutes. We can't be on the phone with a customer more than three minutes. If we're not, we're not handling the call very well. 
That could just be our rule. It doesn't mean we have to. How long do you think the order to get to the cook? I have this restaurant where I live in Raymond, and God, you know, sometimes it's an hour to get a pizza, sometimes it's 20 minutes, sometimes it's two hours, sometimes the order doesn't get to the cook for 30 minutes. <coughs> so um, how long to get that order to the kitchen? Now, with modern computers, a lot of times the orders are just inputted and sent right there. <coughs> well, maybe you need to make a rule. Like I, when I was uh, younger, I was a bartender with we'll, we'll going through college. And I remember, um, I remember one of the things was that sometimes, like, the waitresses or waiters, they might go take breaks and then put the order in, you know, or they might go have a cigarette and then go put the order in because they just wanted to go do it. That's bad, right? We want to say, you're not allowed to do that. You have to always get the order in before you go do something else. Or you may want to go in the back and get, you're like, oh, my table needs some water. We just took an order for another table. Well, the rule is, even though they need water, you need to get that order in first. It sounds like a simple thing to us, but we know that you know if you don't set up the processes, everyone's going to have their own thought on that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, really, really important. I'm just trying to get you guys to think about a little, little, little stuff. Okay. So, some of the requirements is uh, you know, from the orders we need from this whole process. The requirement is we need the correct phone number. We need the correct address. We need the correct pizza. We need to double check, you know, um, anything besides the pizza, the extras. Now, a simple thing. I'll just give you another example. There was uh, in Concord. I used to buy pizza all the time. Um, we have. Uh, I used to work up in Concord. And there's this place called Pizza Market. They make great big pizzas. They were huge. But the order process was horrible. Like, I could guarantee that every single order that we ordered as a company was got the wrong soda, was missing French fries, you know, because you ordered for, you know, like six or seven people. It was always something wrong. And one of the problems is the person who took the order, he spoke broken English. You know, even though there was people there that spoke English pretty well, um, so... He, you know, he would, or, you know, maybe, you know, he could understand, but his penmanship was so bad that nobody else could read. But he was losing money because every time he sent an order, he'd have to go back and get the right thing. And he was probably doing that day after day after day after day. So he didn't have any requirements that they had to be right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And uh, another component that falls into that is uh, the, uh, if you will, the, uh, understanding like you've been abbreviating things and we understand what your abbreviations are but on a pizza order if I write down O on there uh, what could you interpret that as meaning? Uh, boy I don't know. That's you smart. can think of onions, onions. Right. you onions. can think oh, of yeah. olives, olives. Uh, it could also be oregano um, so there needs to be some sort of uh, consensus uh, as to what abbreviations or what nomenclature you will use that's a great point, Robert. That's a great point, is that everything as part of the process, we should have definitions that, you know, that, that people refer to. Um, so, like, that, that's an excellent point. If we're doing a lot of wrong orders, like we saw that orders were incorrectly, then, then you're right. It's part of the process. We may drop this chart down and not even worry about the cooking, right? The, this mm -hmm. whole SIPOC could be just about the order. And it could be broken down even more to say, okay, when you write the order, what exactly do you write? Or how do you type it into the computer? Um, and follow that whole process. So it, it, it can be difficult because in a Six Sigma, a lot of projects fail because they don't get enough detail or they get too much detail. They're spending all the time getting too much detail or they didn't get enough to fix the problem. So mm -hmm. it can be a difficult situation. That's, so for... Um, but you're right. It could be at any one of those steps. One of the best shows to see, if you get a chance to watch it, is um, uh, uh, you guys ever heard of Undercover Boss? Yes. <clears throat> yep. Okay. That is one of my favorite shows. Or um, Chef Ramsey's uh, Kitchen Nightmares is an, uh, another one. Um, he runs around and he helps restaurants get fixed and Undercover Boss. And probably... 
you know, I'd say at least 60 to 70 percent of the time, and any of those shows, why the owner is having so much difficulty is not following their processes. Is especially like the undercover boss will go someplace and he's mad as heck, or she's mad as heck all the time because they're not following the process. Like you might, he or she might own a hamburger joint, and they're not making the hamburgers the way. They said, or they might own a 7-Eleven. They had 7-Eleven on there, or they weren't making the coffee the right way. You know what I mean? So it, it is real, real important. Um, okay. <laughs> now, one of the other map types we have is something called a value stream map. Once again, a value stream map might be introduced in the defined stage. But So you can see it in the defined stage, or you can see it in the... Uh, uh, Measure stage. Okay. Okay. So for homework, what you should try to do is make a use of my paper if you want a pro, uh, a high level process map and an SI POC based on a process that you're familiar with. It could be a past company, could be one you want to make up if you want to, but just try to for. Over the weekend, try to make two of those. The more and more you make, the easier they get for you. All right. Okay. Now, just to ask you, Don, you're saying over the weekend. It's Tuesday. Are we not meeting again this week? No, we are, but I'm just giving everybody time. So you, you can have it done for Oh, okay. Tomorrow. Yeah, you can have it done for tomorrow. It's okay. Um, but, um, yeah, for, yeah. Um, I was, are, you, are you both available tomorrow by any chance? I have an appointment yeah, okay. in the uh, early afternoon. Early, okay, it will be done by then. Could you, would you could you be on by nine? I can be on by nine, yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll keep going. So the measure stage is about five days, about five days. So um, then we'll be off to the next one. This is the biggest one too. They get they get easier than us. Okay, um, the value stream map. Now a value stream map is. Now, I had shown Robert a value stream map before, and Marissa, I don't believe we had the pleasure of it. Once again, many, many, many examples out there of value stream maps. But the goal, one of the amazing things about a value stream map is how little um, uh, value actually goes into a product. And so I think you're going to be kind of amazed to see that, well, we, you know, it looked like we were doing really well. But you may, at the end of the day, only have 25 minutes into a product added value. Let me just see real quick. Okay, so all right. Let me just share something with you guys real quick. Nothing. All right, 
um, okay. Now this will help us give, this map um, will help us give a idea of where our value is coming from at each level. Now there mm -hmm. is, we, there is different versions, so I'm going to go over two different versions of them, but I'm going to do the first one and then I'll do this one that you would see most commonly. Okay, so the very first thing you would do is just draw up top here and you can say in this example, um, we're just looking at the different transactions uh, between manufacturing and non-manufacturing processes. So we're going to get off of our pizza and go more to our, our manufacturing thing, for example. Um, so let's see. Okay. So this is basically uh, somebody working on a com uh, computer and just doing a little task here. We don't really say what the task is, but we can just kind of go over it. So we're doing a little box here up top. And the box would say something like log, and so they're logging something in, and it's, who is it being done by? It's being a uh, computer person, less than one person is actually doing it, okay? Um, You guys see my PowerPoints? Yep. Okay. I've, I've, I've seen at least some of your PowerPoints. Yeah. This won't be easier to. looks like a doctor's office now. What's that? I said it definitely looks like a doctor's office oh, now. It's all Okay, is that readable? <clears throat> Not for me. Oh, it's fuzzy? Yeah. Yeah. I just fuzzy. give it a second. It should catch up to you. It's pixelized. Mm-hmm. Is that any better? I think this is a small delay. Yeah. Eh, I, okay, the stuff inside the boxes I can't read, but everything else, yeah. I see. Okay. Good to know. Okay, I'm going to fix that. Um, any better? Um, Still kind of yeah. Like I said, it it's yeah. It's it gets pixelized. This uh, link is not great. Um, but yeah, it's it's visible. Okay. Is there a way to send the PowerPoint uh, presentation to us, Don? Yeah, um, well, everything I'm showing you in the book I just had printed for you, Marissa, is going to be right there, so it'll be easier to follow along starting tomorrow, a lot mm -hmm. easier. Okay. So if the technology doesn't work that well for a day or whatever, then you can still see it all in the book. All righty. So I have the PowerPoint with the book printed. So when, what you'll be able to do now is you'll 
flip to a page, you'll see the PowerPoint up top, and you'll see the, the explanation down below. So I think it'll make things easier. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, because the bandwidth is so intermittent, I think, sometimes. I mean, like, down in um, Massachusetts, you have files and stuff, which is like, you know, six times faster than what we have. But this should be fast enough. But I don't know if it's Google or not sure yet, but I'll try to figure it out. I'm, um, I'm thinking Google okay, because... Can you uh, read the first thing where it says process steps? Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. So we can... <coughs> all right. So the value stream map in this example, um, we can see that it's showing like they want to log, so they have a computer person, and then they have a... Uh, it's going to the right, like a route, department, assignments, one person, okay. Disposition, grid lines. Now, the mm -hmm. important thing to see is below each one of these, underneath the log route disposition, it has a CT, uptime, hours, breaks, hours available, seconds available. That's going to yeah. start to give us an idea of how much time... Oh, I'm sorry, Robert, go ahead. No, I, I'm just saying, yes, I see. Can, can read that. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, so you guys can see it okay right now? Mm. Yeah, if I use enough drugs. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So, what does CT mean? Anyone? Cycle what does C time. slash T mean? It says C slash T equals fifteen seconds. C slash T equals seventy-five seconds. Mm hmm. I'm assuming cycle time. Right, cycle. Very good. Cycle time. So we're keeping track of the cycle time. 15 seconds, uptime, 90 seconds, 8 hours. And then if we route, and then we go to this position, 255. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cut check. Available 22.950. Mail delivery is the uh, <coughs> 100 seconds. Okay. Now, on the bottom of the chart, steps. Days of work in the queue uh, and, mm -hmm. and step processing time. So we have 15 seconds. We have 20. We have uh, two days, 20 days, 16 days, 255 seconds, 1.6, 15, 17.5. So at 100. So based on this, it's going to take quite a while, uh, quite a few days in between to actually get anything done because of all the waiting time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Alright, so <coughs> it's this is showing that how, how that one works, but I don't know, it's a, it's an okay example, but I, I'm gonna show you another one of the board in a second. Okay, you guys see the whiteboard again? Yep. Okay, great. Yes. Okay. <coughs> now, some of the things that we do are the value stream analysis, which helps us with this value map. <coughs> and this one's kind of a fun um, one to make. 
We're going to base this one on more of a, a manufacturing um, schedule. Now, the first thing we want to do is usually you'll draw like a little like a little box for your suppliers. A box for your suppliers. And you can always look up value stream map or value stream analysis. Either one will work. But I'll just usually draw like a little thing like this. And this will mean that symbol will mean supplier. So that supplier, and then they usually have the form of transportation. So they'll draw a little truck, or they could draw a boat, they could draw a train, you know, whatever it is. So we'll just say we have two suppliers in this situation. And you can name the supplier, I'll just put supplier one, supplier two, and they're both coming by truck. So you just draw a little truck, easy enough, right? And then it's got to go to receiving. So this is going to start our phase, and so we're going to receive it after we order it in five days. So five days from there, we're going to be receiving the product. Then we're going to have to start to do the same thing, but break it up a little bit better. And the thing that we want to do is then also take a look um, at what are the processes that we're going to be utilizing. Now, down to the bottom, you would draw like a little line and because this line means that we have, this is not adding value. When we were waiting, Marissa, were we adding value? No. This, for that process, right? We, did we make any money by placing an order? That's no. Question. You didn't, did you? That's a question you have to ask yourself. So we did not make any money because we placed an order. And that's important to get. So now we can start to identify our first part of the process. This is just a general one, but okay, so um, the first thing I just have listed out here is milling. We have to mill the product. So mill it. How many people? We're going to say two people. Doesn't really tell us what, you know, the value of it. We're just trying to find the time. The CT was two minutes. Um, the CO was two hours. The uptime was 74%. <clears throat> okay. So out of that, um, Robert, what does CO mean? C slash O? Change over. Change over, right? Okay. And um, so we ended up with a two hour change over time. Two minutes on the product. So how many, how much value added did we get as a result of this? Well, let's say the two minutes. Two minutes. That's it. Because we were only in the process for two minutes. Does that make sense? Yeah. That works. So we'll mm -hmm. do the next one. Okay. So, but between the next process, there's ten days. Sitting around the shelf for ten days, and it's going to be going to welding. So it goes to welding, okay. And once again, we're just going to say it's two people. Now, some more defined ones may say what we're paying these people on average too, but you know this one doesn't. The CT is four minutes. <coughs> Changeover is uh, three hours. Uptime was 61%. And sometimes we may have like waste also on there. Like sometimes they'll say like, oh, the waste did bad. Well, jobs was 20 pounds of waste. So they can also keep track of that. But somebody might want to go put all of this in a spreadsheet. And they'll say, oh, okay, let's really calculate everything out. We're not doing all those calculations at this point. But somebody might. And so out of this one, we said that we ran the process for four minutes, so we ended up with four minutes of value added. On the first one, we had two minutes of value added. 
On the second one, we only had four minutes of value. Uh, we had four minutes of value added. Look how many days have gone through. We have had over 15 days, and we've only had six minutes of value added. Is that crazy or what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then it goes to the next process. And between the next process, there is 15 days. And it's going to go to painting. Okay. And now we're going to add some value. So the painting is something that the customers are paying for, right? They're paying for the milling. We're charging that as part of the product. We're charging part of the welding. We're parting the painting. So 15 days, so if we do painting, I know it's hard to read this, but this thing is so big to write. We can say three people. All I really care about is that you can see it. Um, the CT is seven minutes. Okay. The uh, CO was four hours. And maybe hazardous waste, we west, wasted 60 pounds. And like I said, it's just important because you may want to go put these formulas back in some other number. So if we had a CT of two, uh, if we had a CT of painting, uh, seven minutes. So for value added, only seven minutes. And then we wait again, eight days. Okay, and this is thankfully the end because I'm running out of room. So, um, and the last step is we're going to assemble inspection, assemble and inspection, and once again we just draw it out. So we have three people, and we have a CT at two minutes. I would say CO of an hour, and uptime ninety-three percent, no waste at this stage. And from a result of this, we ended up with two minutes. Of value added. Now, what's probably confusing is we only added two minutes of value added here, we only had four minutes of value added here, seven minutes of value added here, and two minutes of value added here. So, our total lead time based on everything, because we had the five days, the ten, uh, uh, we had the five days, we had the ten days, we had the fifteen days, and we had the eight days, and then by the time we send it out to the customer, might be another. 30 days, we just say. We send it out to the customer for 30 days. That would give us, I know you guys should read this, 68 days lead time. And you know, although you can't see, you just have to trust me, all of the value added was 15 minutes. All the value added was only 15 minutes. Pretty incredible, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what did we what did we learn from that? We learned that um, in a company, most of the time we're not adding value to a product, are we? We're actually not making any money from the product. Most of the money we spent running the company is spending it getting it to the point of adding value to it. So we can sell it. Now the hard part about these charts, it's not done yet, because we, you know, we said it would, now we go out to the customer. So you just draw a little thing going out to the customer, and then in the middle, um, Marissa, this would be interesting to you. You'd have a thing called, you know, the product. Uh, usually a second called product control, and the product control, it would have little arrows going between each one of these steps. And what these steps are going to do is just <clears throat> information that's going to help with these processes. Like the supplier, um, the annual production plan would be from product control. Because, you know, a lot of times with big suppliers, we have to, we have to give them like a, a lead time, you know, um, what we think we're going to need over the next year. We need a delivery schedule. Okay. Um, the milling, they need a weekly schedule. What are they going to work on, right? The product control, uh, they, um, the welding needs a schedule. What should they be working on? 
<coughs> painting, what's painting need, right? They need a schedule, what they should be working on. Um, of course, assembly and inspection needs a schedule, what they should be working on. And your customer, we, our customers should have an expected delivery date. Expect a delivery schedule, but they should also be providing us, um, if they can, a forecast of what they're going to be needing. Just like we su we supplied our vendor with a market forecast, we could also ask our customer for a market forecast. So let's just review this a little bit, because this would be something fun for you guys to do on the weekend, you know, maybe get your family involved. All right. So the very first thing, Marissa and Robert, we do is we look at the where our suppliers right we just we figure out how many days it takes to get from our suppliers to us we said five we make sure that they have a hopefully in the future like a, a plan for products we have, we're providing delivery schedules all the way along in this example we did milling we found out that we're only milling for uh, two minutes per piece we go to welding we said like four minutes, we went to uh, painting, which was seven minutes. We went to um, uh, manufacturing, I mean assembly and inspection, which was two minutes. And all along this time, we had delays. We had five days, 10 days, 15 days, eight days, and 30 day delays. So it's important for us to understand that those delays um, are affecting our customer service, but this is what it takes currently in our process. Another important thing is, hear what I said. I said this is on a per piece basis. Now, a lot of people will argue and say, well, yeah, but we might do a setup for two hours, but we may run 500 pieces, right? We may run 1,000 pieces. We may run a million pieces. So that changeover, uh, you know, gets taken away. And you can, you can do that. You can go back in your formula and say, all right, well, for... We, we know that we won't run less than 1,000, and you can adjust your value added that way. You can say, okay, well, we're running 1,000, but the reason they do it on a per piece basis generally is because a lot of times we don't know how much we're going to run consistently. Like, because customer orders change. Like, if we're making um, boots like Timberland, Timberland may decide that when they do their manufacturing run that they're going to make uh, 1,000 purple boots this year. Next, next time they do the run, purple boots aren't selling so well. So they do 500 purple boots. Next year, purple boots are doing really good. So they decided to make 1,500 purple boots. So it's a lot easier to keep track of it on a per piece basis than try to guess what your future um, manufacturing um, uh, uh, plan is. How many, are you, gonna, how many do you think you're going to manufacture next time? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And if you're always sticking with this formula and you always know it's a per piece basis, then you know it's kind of consistent. But if there are, I mean, obviously there is an argument that well, we are adding more value after that two hours. Okay. Any questions? Well, other, oh, sorry, go ahead, Robert. Well, the other thing to point in there because yeah, I, you know, come from a manufacturing uh, background too from this last job, is that. Uh, uh, one way to increase your efficiency is to wait until you have, let's say, 10,000 to do so that we do the changeover in three hours and we run 10,000. Then your uh, changeover time per piece becomes infinitesimal. You know, and they like, oh, that's great, we can do that. The problem is then is that you introduce days and days of delay for your customer while we wait for 10,000 to build up. Um, the uh, the other approach to it, and this is more the lean approach, is to let's find out how to shorten the cycle time. Let's find out to sh how to shorten the wait time. So on a per piece basis, we have less impact without having to to uh, batch up things. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um. <coughs> Now, a lot of times the small companies, they're not really tracking this stuff as, as much. You know, because like, they, they're just like, oh, we got an order. Let's just run the order. We got an order. Let's just run the order. 
But even if they just track it after the fact, they can at least see how much they made um, uh, off of that run. You know what I mean? They could at least say, okay, this is what it took. And they may, and they can say, okay, well, next time we get a similar order, how can we reduce this stuff? Because custom shops may have to do this, you know, some of the stuff after the fact, but it can definitely be done. And um, the other student who's in class tomorrow, uh, Claude, he worked for a shop. That's all they did was custom work. So they really, all they did was kind of say, okay, well, the machines cost this much, everything costs this much. And they would look at the processes, but not as much because they figured stuff changed so much. Why fix it? But they could have done a bigger view of it like we just did. The software was ways to solve some, um, uh, make things better. Because unfortunately in companies, you don't, a lot of times they don't look for solutions until they have a problem. That's yeah. how it was done traditionally. If it's not broke, don't fix it. But Six Sigma, we assume everything's broken. At Six Sigma, we assume that nothing is as good as it could be. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yep. We're always saying we can do it better. We're a real pain. It will grow to hate you. Because <laughs> people do not like change. They don't like change, but uh, one of the things to to uh, that I've used this process before uh, in doing is uh, is looking at it and said let's let's prove that what we're doing is the right way, and the only way to do it is to examine it and consider the alternatives. Sure, sure, I agree with you 100 percent. Sometimes I've gotten more buy-in on an approach like that when people say, Robert, why are you trying to change this? Well, let's prove that it's right. Exactly. And, 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 and I mean, Robert, your attitude is excellent. You want to try making changes. You want to try making it better. But sometimes people just, you know, they're like, they don't want to learn one more thing. You know, they're overwhelmed by just trying to fix the new DVD player, their new phone. How does this new LCD TV work? Now you got to go to work and order something else. You know, I, I, I'm worried about how do I use my Facebook account? You, you know what I mean? Now it's even harder because people have so many other things they're worried about knowing that, that might be outside of the company. Okay. Yeah. They, got a new, they got a new car with a digital display. They're like, oh, I got to learn this now, too. So. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we did a process map. Let's see. Okay, just... And you said all of these maps are in the book, correct? Um, yep, a version of them, yep. Okay, how do we identify customer requirements sometimes? What are some, uh, we, we briefly talked about it, but what are some of the things that, um, to identify customer requirements that we would use? We have voice of the customer, right? Mm -hmm. Voice of the employee, and what's the last one? Anybody remember voice of? The business. Business, B-O-B, -B, right? So mm -hmm. um, those will help us when we're doing our process maps if uh, we want to put the requirements in. And we always said that we have upper and lower levels. And we can't forget in Six Sigma that nothing is ever perfect, right? There's always some kind of variation. What is the variation we accept? We always have to say there has to be some type of variation. We have to have everything measurable. Um, okay. We can also have we can also make charts that are for supplier requirements. For example, like what do our suppliers need from us? Like, do they need a five-day wait time? What? How? We got to make sure that when we order from them, it's quick and it's fast. And everything that we would need. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, one of the factors too, and this is one. Uh, like from supplier one, uh, maybe we get the parts from supplier one um, for 
50 cents less per part. They come in in a big box just jumbled together and it takes uh, one person a whole day to pull them out and sort them out and have them ready to eat and use. Absolutely. Um, and if you, factor, if you factor in that time and that delay, all of a sudden uh, that 50 cent discount is, is looking pretty expensive. Uh, absolutely. And, and that does happen a lot. People will um, try to save money, but in the end they have, they have more returns or uh, it doesn't work as well. Well, I've, I've, I've got one just from, from my last company, just a real quick one. Uh, they stuck they stuck me on the floor and made me an op machine operator because they can't get their uh, work done in time. They, they cannot figure it out. So one of the things they did is they made me an operator because they knew I'd stick my nose into it. The third day, the guy from corporate who did this came and asked me how it was going, just wondering if I'm getting my, you know, if, if I'm, you know, getting my feet set in this. I drug him over to a book where we uh, recorded part change information, and showing him that we changed one particular part on this machine 83 times. I, I'm sorry, 85 times in one shift. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, that seems like high. I pointed out to him that it was an average. You could use an average of three minutes per part change for the process. That the, for 80 times, that was three minutes. That's 240 minutes. That out of an eight-hour shift, that machine was stopped for four hours, changing one part. Oh my God! What do you say? Well, he he blew up and then went to go talk to the purchasing manager why we were buying the parts in small quantities, because we got a great discount and free shipping. Oh. <laughs> okay. No, I mean this is this is very serious. This, this happened um, from the from the per purchasing manager's perspective he was doing a great job right 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 and but it wasn't until you actually it wasn't until you actually map out the impact that you can say oh no this is not good at all <clears throat> that's very funny that's uh but it's very typical you know it's very very typical it's it's they were saying and, and, the whole process was and nobody was raising an issue about it because the operators, uh, well, they're paid to be there for eight hours, right. whether they're changing parts or running boards. Um, you know, uh, I mean, people, you know, some people sit there and felt, well, this is kind of stupid, but this is what they gave us, so okay. Um, nobody spoke up, and that was probably why they stuck me out there because I'm sitting there going, this is stupid. we got to change this. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, now we're good, and anytime, like Marissa, you want to jump in with like an example, that's awesome. It helps make the class real more enjoyable. Okay, Marissa. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. The next thing is what we're going to do is we're going to go over failure mode effective analysis. Why don't we take like a quick little break, um, like just give everybody five minutes to walk around. Okay. And then uh, we'll start up on F M E A. So. I will see you guys in less than five minutes or whatever. Okay? Okay. okay. okay.